Uh, well, thank you very much, Jeff, for that introduction. I'm very pleased to be here at the CETA State of the Nation conference, an important conference. Uh, and it's a pleasure to speak to CETA, the Committee for the Economic Development of Australia. And my proposition to you today is that a critical driver of the economic development of Australia is the shape and functioning of our big cities. The Turnbull government's infrastructure, investment and cities agenda is therefore an important policy tool to achieve our national economic policy objectives. And today I want to start by outlining the economic importance of our cities before then turning to talk about the role of major infrastructure projects in shaping cities and finally, to explain the Turnbull government's infrastructure investment agenda, including some of the big infrastructure commitments we've recently announced. So let me turn first then to the economic importance of our cities. To start with, they're where most Australians live. 64% of Australians live in our five biggest cities. Around 80% of us live in cities of more than 75,000 people. On present trends, the proportion of Australians living in cities and their suburbs is likely to increase. Our four largest cities grew at a rate annually of 2.1% from 2006 to 2016, compared to a 1.7% growth rate for our total population. Our cities are critical to our prosperity. They, they are where most economic activity occurs. In 2015-16, the capital cities of Australia contributed 1.17 trillion to the national economy, 71% of gross domestic product. According to the Grattan Institute, 80% of the dollar value of all goods and services in Australia is produced on just 0.2 of 1% of our land mass, and nearly all of that in our cities. The combined CBDs of Sydney and Melbourne, just 7.1 square kilometres in area, create almost 10% of the total value of Australia's goods and services. Now, one reason for the productivity of our cities is that high-skilled and highly educated workers tend to live in cities. In our four largest cities, the share of people with tertiary qualifications is around 30%, compared to around 18% for the rest of Australia. Our cities dominate the knowledge services sector, with around 75% of Australia's knowledge workers living in our four largest cities. So this is another indicator of the growing relative importance of our cities because knowledge workers and knowledge services are making up an ever bigger share of our economy. Knowledge services have expanded from 13% to 18% of GDP since 1990. And in the same period, the share of knowledge service workers has risen from 11 to 14 per cent. Now, the changing structure of our economy has major implications for our cities and their transport networks. Between the 1940s and the 1970s, the development of our cities reflected the growth of manufacturing in metropolitan suburbs. At the same time, uh, rates of car ownership were rising steadily as cars became more affordable, and much of our existing road network built between the 50s and the 70s, was built to accommodate these dynamics. But the knowledge intensive businesses that are increasingly important to, the to today's economy tend to be concentrated in central business districts or in employment clusters such as universities and hospitals and their surrounding areas. The data also suggest that the economic value generated in a geographic area is correlated to the density of people living there. According to the Grattan Institute, the Sydney CBD produced $100 in value for every hour worked there in 2011-12. Parramatta, effectively the second CBD in the Sydney conurbation, produced $68 for each hour worked. Now, the growing economic importance of cities linked to the rise of the knowledge economy is not unique to Australia. It's a phenomenon we see in all advanced economies. The North American academic Richard Florida has written extensively about the way that cities foster economic activity, particularly by bringing knowledge workers together in a way that demonstrably stimulates creativity and productivity. In the economic jargon, greater density fosters knowledge sharing between firms 
and knowledge spillovers between sectors. In a 2015 newspaper opinion piece following the Canadian election, Florida called for a ministry of cities in that country, arguing that cities are key to innovation, productivity and economic growth. Quotes, each of those things revolves around one central pivot, the health and well-being of our cities. Along with talent and technological innovation, it is urbanisation, dense, diverse cities that powers innovation and economic growth today. Of course, similar thinking lay behind the decision by Prime Minister Turnbull in 2015 to appoint the first minister for cities at the Commonwealth level under a Liberal National Government. Well, if our cities are responsible for a, for a large and growing part of our economy, and if more and more Australians are living in our cities, it makes good sense to have a clear policy focus on how we can make our cities as productive, efficient and liveable as possible. But this raises an obvious question. What, what are the policy levers open to the Commonwealth Government to help secure those outcomes? One of the most important such levers is the Commonwealth's investment in major transport infrastructure projects. Transport networks shape the physical layout of cities. Where you build, when you build transport arteries and nodes, development follows. <coughs> As influential US cities theorist Ed Glaser tells us, transport technologies have always determined the urban form. A similar point was made in a 2012 report to the Victorian government entitled Long Run Economic and Land Use Impacts of Major Infrastructure Projects, which analysed the impact of several major projects in Melbourne, including the Western Ring Road and City Loop. It concluded, quotes, the message from this report is clear. Major transport investments are a powerful and perhaps the preeminent policy lever for determining metropolitan structure. We can see the impact of this principle in modern Australian cities in numerous ways. One is the influence of rail corridors on where new housing is being located, particularly townhouses and apartments in our inner and middle ring suburbs. Between 2001 and 2016, 46% of all new dwellings built in Sydney, some 192,000 dwellings in total, were built within one kilometre of a train station. For Melbourne, the figure was 38%, for Brisbane, 34%. Another way we see this principle at work is the role of rail connectivity in boosting economic clusters. If there's a convenient train service to a location, that's, that makes it attractive for people as a place to work. In turn, it's a desirable location for businesses because they know it will be easier to attract employees. So rail can be an important factor to attract jobs and economic activity. We see a good example of this in Macquarie Park in Sydney, which in 2016 became Sydney's second largest office market, surpassing North Sydney in 2013. Macquarie Park has witnessed the fastest growth in standalone office employment of all major centres in New South Wales over the last two decades, growing by an estimated 6.6% per annum and far outpacing rates of growth across the metropolitan area as a whole. Rail connectivity has been a major factor in attracting new business activity to the area. Following the establishment of the Chatswood to Epping Rail Link in 2009, the total economic output of Macquarie Park rose from 4.68 billion in 2002 to 9.1 billion in 2013. Now a third illustration of this principle is the way that major infrastructure investment influences land values. For instance, land located near stations on the new Sydney Metro North West Rail Line has recently experienced very marked increases in value. Once it became clear that this transformational project was actually going to be delivered thanks to the good work of the Berejiklian government, property developers were willing to pay for tens of millions of dollars more for residential properties in locations such as Castle Hill. Similarly, in the case of the M1 motorway in Brisbane, average annual growth in industrial land values during the planning, construction and delivery of the gateway upgrade project between 2003 and 2010 was 22% compared to the market-wide average of 16%. In short, the market places significant value on and extracts significant value from major infrastructure projects being delivered. 
Well, let me now turn to explaining how the Turnbull government's infrastructure investment agenda is designed to support the growth and transformation of our cities so that they remain productive, efficient and liveable even as they grow. I want to highlight four features of our agenda. The first feature is that we have a long-term plan. Infrastructure sector stakeholders have long called for the Australian Government to provide more long-term certainty, to move beyond short-term political cycles and to maximise the opportunities for community and private sector involvement in nationally significant infrastructure. That's why the Turnbull Government's record infrastructure commitment of $75 billion over 10 years in this year's budget has been so widely welcomed. For the first time, the Australian Government has committed to a credible, decade-long pipeline of infrastructure projects focused on driving economic growth, increasing productivity and connectivity and creating new employment opportunities. It offers greater certainty to both state governments and industry participants compared to the traditional approach of confining commitments to the four-year forward estimates period. For example, the state government in Victoria can now advance planning for the North East Link motorway project, confident in the knowledge that the Commonwealth will support the project with a $1.75 billion grant commitment. Infrastructure projects of this scale have a multi-year planning and approval process, and construction often takes three to five years, sometimes longer. So setting out a 10-year schedule of commitments as we have done makes very good sense. The second feature of our approach is a focus on urban rail. This is designed to respond to several factors. First, rail usage in our cities is growing strongly. In Perth, urban heavy rail patronage rose 94% between 2001-2 and 2016-17. In Melbourne, it rose nearly 80% in this period. In Adelaide, 79%. In Sydney, over 27%. Secondly, as our cities get larger, they are inevitably becoming denser. If a growing share of Australians are to make the choice to live in townhouses and apartments, part of what makes that choice attractive must be better public transport. Just as the great cities of the world, London, New York, Shanghai, Hong Kong and others, make extensive use of metro-style rail services, so that will be increasingly important as Australia's big cities grow. Already, we are seeing a notable increase in the density of our housing stock in our biggest cities. Across Australia, the proportion of townhouses and semi-detached dwellings rose from 10 to 13 per cent between 2011 and 2016. In Sydney, the overall supply of high density housing grew by just over a third between 2011 and 2016. Growing density has significant implications for transport planning. As our cities get more dense, heavy rail starts to have clear advantages over other transport modes because of its capacity to move large numbers of people quickly and reliably. A train line can move 50,000 people an hour. Compare this with a freeway lane, which can move 2,500 people an hour. A third factor, of course, is the very substantial capital cost of urban rail. Several of our state governments are making major investments, but the Turnbull government believes there's also a role for the Commonwealth. That's why we committed to a national rail program in the 2017 budget. We promised to invest $10 billion over the next 10 years in transformational rail projects to better connect our cities, suburbs and surrounding regional areas. In the 2018 budget, we made major commitments for urban rail, partly funded out of that program. These include up to $5 billion for a rail connection between the City of Melbourne and Tullamarine Airport, $1.05 billion for the Metronet project, which will build several new or expanded rail lines across Perth, and $390 million for the Beerburrum to Nambour project on Queensland Sunshine Coast. These build on other rail investments that we've made in recent years, such as $95 million for Gold Coast Light Rail Stage 2, $490 million for Perth's Forest Field Airport Link, $42.8 million for Flinders Link in Adelaide, and many, many others. The third feature of our infrastructure agenda is to support employment clusters. 
New transport infrastructure can help drive the growth of employment clusters, as Macquarie Park, which I mentioned earlier, clearly demonstrates. Our commitment to invest up to $5 billion in a rail link to Melbourne Airport is an important opportunity to support the employment cluster at the airport, as well, of course, as providing much needed enhanced connectivity for passengers. Already, the airport is one of Victoria's largest employment clusters outside of the Melbourne CBD, generating more than 14,300 direct and 43,000 indirect jobs. Direct rail connectivity would make it an even more attractive location for businesses and help generate even more jobs. Another important opportunity in Melbourne is Monash University and its surrounding area. The Victorian Government has identified the Monash precinct as a national employment cluster, a concentrated corridor of knowledge-based businesses and industry that provides high levels of employment. But constraints on existing public transport are limiting the growth potential of this precinct. Patronage on the 601 bus route serving Monash University has more than doubled in the last five years. It's now the busiest bus route in Melbourne and faces a serious bottleneck at Huntingdale Station. By connecting Monash to Melbourne's heavy rail network, we could unlock significant new jobs and economic opportunity. That's why the Turnbull government in this year's budget announced $475 million towards the transformational Monash rail line. This funding commitment has been struck at a level to make heavy rail feasible. Indicative work commissioned by Monash University suggests that a heavy rail shuttle from the campus to Huntingdale Station would cost around $1 billion. Similar principles underpin the investment we're making around the country. Flinderslink will connect the Flinders University Hospital into the Adelaide Metropolitan Rail Network. The Forestfield Airport, rail, uh, Airport Link Project will see the employment cluster at Perth Airport connected by rail. The recently announced plan for a new rail line to Western Sydney Airport is designed to provide excellent connectivity to the jobs cluster which will develop at the airport and the nearby Aerotropolis. <clears throat> Mention of Western Sydney Airport leads me to the fourth feature of our infrastructure agenda that I want to highlight, leveraging the Commonwealth's infrastructure spend to achieve, to achieve broader policy objectives particularly through the use of city deals. The Western Sydney city deal announced in March this year is a good example. This is a long-term partnership between the Commonwealth and New South Wales governments together with eight Western Sydney councils, which aims to align planning, infrastructure investment and governance to accelerate job creation, stimulate urban renewal and drive economic reforms. It has a particular focus on maximising the business attracting, jobs generating power of the Commonwealth's $5.3 billion investment in Western Sydney Airport. Over the next 20 years, an extra half million people are expected to live in the areas served by these councils. So the deal includes a commitment to release over 180,000 new home sites. The Western Sydney councils have committed to develop a new planning partnership. This is intended to provide for more efficient and higher quality outcomes throughout these council areas. Another aspect of the deal's focus on land use planning is that the Commonwealth and New South Wales governments are working together to plan the Badgerys Creek Aerotropolis near the airport. This will be a hub for sectors such as advanced manufacturing, aerospace and defence and education and skills. And together with the airport will form the economic core of a thriving and highly livable city to be built around it. The rail line, which I mentioned earlier, is another key element of the city deal. The Australian and New South Wales governments have jointly committed to build rail from St Mary's to the future Badgerys Creek Aerotropolis via Western Sydney Airport, with a shared objective to have rail to the airport by the time it opens. The two governments have agreed to construct this first stage of the rail link as equal partners, each contributing 50% of the cost. This is stage one of what's ultimately envisaged as a multi-stage north-south rail link running from Campbelltown and Norellon in the south to Schofields in the north. This will shape the new western parkland city as development is drawn to the rail corridor and it's been described as the steel spine of the new city. The Australian and New South Wales governments are contributing up to $50 million each for a business case for the first stage of the north-south rail link to be delivered in late 2019. 
We're now working to apply some of these same principles in Perth. In April, the Prime Minister and the Premier of Western Australia signed a memorandum of understanding to prioritise negotiation for a city deal in Perth. The aim is to leverage the Australian government's cumulated $2.3 billion investment in the Metronet rail projects to drive policy outcomes in areas such as planning, housing, smart infrastructure, value capture and local government coordination. The City Deal will also look at other focus areas such as economic diversification and driving new employment opportunities in suburban centres. Well, let me conclude then as I began with the proposition that the future of our cities is key to Australia's economic development. I've argued today that the Turnbull government's infrastructure spending is a key policy lever to keep our cities remaining efficient, productive and liveable as our economy transforms and our cities grow. Our infrastructure spend is aligned to the key economic priorities of the Turnbull government, investing to drive productivity and efficiency in our cities and urban areas, building transport links to reduce congestion and, and produce time savings for commuters and businesses, and using city deals to deliver a wide-ranging policy agenda designed to keep our cities and in turn our nation internationally competitive.